Open your Bibles to Luke chapter 16, if you would, this morning. We've been reading the book of Luke together. We're reading the New Testament together as a congregation this year. And we are currently, obviously, in the book of Luke. This week, if you would like to read with us, we're reading Luke chapter 21 through 24. So the last chapters of the book of Luke. But this past week, we read from Luke 16 to Luke 20. In Luke 16, there are some of the most frightening words that Jesus ever spoke. I just want to read them together with you this morning. Luke 16, just indulge me if you will for a moment. Listen, and this goes flat against a lot of people's concept of who Jesus is. But these words are from the Lord himself. And the warning that he's giving us is don't waste your life. Don't spend your life in empty pursuits in things that don't matter and that won't make a difference in eternity. Spend your life on things that matter. Listen to this account, Luke 16, beginning in verse 19. Listen to what the Lord says. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and feasted sumptuously every day. By the way, he just described every one of us. This rich man was dressed well and he ate well. And all of us We may consider ourselves to be poor, but we dress well, we eat well. The scripture goes on to say, at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus and he was covered with sores. He desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And the rich man called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. And now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. Besides all this, there is between us a great chasm that's been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And he said, the rich man, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And the rich man said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. The words of Jesus Christ. You read those words and the title of the lesson this morning is what a lost soul learned in death. And somebody says, that sounds really I mean, just looking out on the surface, it sounds so harsh. But do you understand that Jesus came and he died on that cross, not just because he was trying to be nice to us. He came and died on that cross because he was saving us from a fate like this one. In Luke 19, verse 10 that we read this week, Jesus said his whole mission was to seek and to save people who are lost. That's what he came to do. And Christianity is not a religion that just gives us a moral set of ethical rules to follow. Christianity is a system of salvation. Souls that are lost and that are condemned to the fate that we read about the rich man experiencing here, our souls, they can be saved because of the blood that Jesus shed for you on a cross 2,000 years ago. And brothers and sisters and friends, it's bad news what happens to the rich man and the people that die outside of Christ, but it's good news that all of us have the opportunity to know God through what Jesus has done for us. And so when you read passages like this one, think of it this way. It's not that God is unloving, it is that God is like a loving parent who warns their child, do not put your hand on the hot stove. Let me tell you what will happen if you put your hand on the hot stove and describing in detail what will happen to a child to warn them, don't do this, don't make this decision. 
God is saying to you this morning, don't waste your life. Don't take your life and throw it away on empty things. Even wealth, which is attractive to most of us, even wealth is an empty pursuit. No one can serve two masters. Either you love God or you love money. You cannot serve both God and money. Matthew 6, verse 24, the rich man tried to do that. And the rich man learned some things in death. Let's talk about what a lost soul learned in death based on this passage that we just read a moment ago. The first thing the rich man learned as he raised up his eyes in torment, he learned the meaning of eternity. Brothers and sisters and friends, the life you are now living is short. The Bible reminds us of its brevity. In James chapter 4, verse 14, the scripture says, what is your life? It's like a mist, a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Job says in Job 7, verse 7, all my days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle, a shuttle that goes back and forth on a loom. Again, Job says in Job 9, verse 25, my days are swifter than a runner. They're passing quickly. And those of us who are getting older, isn't it amazing how quickly the years start to go? The older you get, the faster the weeks go by, the faster the months go by, the faster the years seem to go by. The psalmist says in Psalm 90, verse 10, our days are soon gone. Even if we live 70, 80 years, they're soon gone and we fly away. The life you're living is short. And brothers and sisters and friends, life is too short for you to waste it. The rich man, as he lifts up his eyes in torment, thinks about the brevity of his life. And he also contemplates the meaning of eternity. Everything that you have ever known except for God has an ending. Every friendship, every relationship, every job, everything that you have ever known in life has an ending. Eternity is life without end. And we can't wrap our finite minds around that. We cannot fully comprehend eternity. But the scripture tells us that we serve a God who is eternal in his nature. Psalm 90 verse 2, from everlasting In the past to everlasting in the future, you are God. The God that we serve is eternal. He has no end. And the point here is that you have no end. You have a beginning because you're created by God, but you have no end. You're like God in that regard. You will last, you will live somewhere forever. And so when we think about how we're living our lives, the rich man before he died should have given more serious thought to eternity. He should have thought about where he was going to be forever. You need to think about where you are going to be forever because eternity is long. It has no end. Jesus very plainly When he talked about why he had come to earth, he talked about things like eternal life. And he also, friends, talked about eternal punishment. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 9, the scripture speaks of eternal condemnation or destruction. In Jude verse 7, the book talks about the punishment of eternal fire. In Titus 1 verse 2, we have become Christians and we hope for eternal life which God promised he cannot lie before time began. Eternity never ends. When we've been there 10,000 years, we'll have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. That's just the beginning. Eternity has no end. And so as this rich man dies and lifts up his eyes in torment, He begins to understand, it begins to sink in on him. I'm here, eternity has begun for me. You're living your life right now, it's a brief life. Don't wait until you die to contemplate the meaning of eternity. Secondly, this morning, what did the rich man learn? He learned the reality of eternal punishment. I know this is not tasteful to a lot of people in our society today. You cannot change what the Bible teaches about this subject. 
The Bible teaches, and Jesus said more about it than anybody else in the Bible. So if you claim that he's your Lord, and if you claim that he is the one who always tells the truth, you've got to take his words seriously. You cannot just dismiss them or ignore them or just wave them away. Jesus talked about the reality of eternal punishment. He describes it in vivid detail here. Again, Luke 16, 23, in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes. Now, some people might say, well, stop right there, John, because it mentions this place called Hades. What is that? What is the Hadean realm? And, and why is it that the rich man is said to be there? Let me just describe it this way very briefly. In the Bible, Hades is described as a temporary arrangement in Revelation 20, verse 13, when the Bible describes the final judgment, all of us will one day stand before God and we will give an answer for how we've lived our lives on the judgment day. But the Bible tells us that prior to that day of judgment, that death and Hades will surrender the dead that are in them. Hades is a temporary arrangement. It is a place where departed souls go to await the day of judgment. Revelation 20 verse 15 teaches us that all who have lived will one day rise from the dead and we will stand before God on that day in judgment. All of us will. And so this man goes to a place that is a temporary arrangement waiting the day of his judgment. The scripture says that those who are unrighteous, those who live lives that are displeasing to God or refuse to know God or reject God's word, reject his gospel, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 7 through 9, they will be condemned at the day of judgment to a place that Jesus calls hell. Mark chapter 9 verses 47 and 48. Jesus again says more about hell and judgment than he says about heaven. And he says more about hell and judgment than anybody else in the Bible. Listen to the words of the Savior. He described in vivid detail the reality of eternal punishment. And so look at what this rich man is experiencing. As he says, I'm in torment, I'm here in these, in these flames. He lifts up his eyes and think about what he's experiencing. The scripture describes on three occasions in Luke 16, his torment, his anguish. It is an agonizing place for him to be. Again, in verse 24, he tries to make a bargain with Abraham. Abraham, please send Lazarus. And all I want, the only thing that would bring comfort to me is just one drop of water. Have Lazarus dip his finger in water and cool my tongue. But there's not even that mercy available. As you live your life right now, you are constantly the beneficiary of God's mercy. Every day you wake up, you live in his world, you eat food that he provides, you enjoy the weather that he gives us, you are a beneficiary of the good things of God. Even if you are an enemy of God, he still blesses his enemies. Matthew chapter 5 verses 44 and 45. But when this life comes to a conclusion, if we stay outside of God's will, we will also find ourselves outside of the mercy of God. And that is a place you have never been and never yet experienced. But that's what Jesus is warning us about. There is no means of deliverance. There's a great chasm, a great gulf that's fixed between Abraham and the rich man, Jesus tells us. And nobody can go across either direction. The righteous cannot go across to the place of torment, and neither can those in the place of torment go across to the place of paradise. Again, the reality of eternal punishment. Jesus speaks very plainly. You and I should take his words seriously. It's a terrible fate to contemplate. Thirdly, this morning, what did this rich man learn? What did the lost soul learn? He learned the urgency of today. I'm talking about today while we still live. Do you realize there's an urgency to obey, obeying God? Do you realize that a lot of people fall for the devil's favorite lie? The devil's favorite lie is, oh, there will always be tomorrow. There will always be another opportunity. There will always, the sun will come up tomorrow. The devil wants you to believe those things. And he wants you to delay and to delay and to delay. 
And the rich man, he finds out too late the urgency of right now. Look at verses 27 and 28. When the rich man speaks to Abraham, he says, fine, if there's no mercy for me and if there's no way that anybody could come across and there's no way for me to go back to to life, at least send Lazarus, send him back from the dead so that he can talk to my brothers and tell my brothers not to come to this place. One of the things I learned from this passage in Luke 16 is that those who have passed out of this life, they remember us. They remember the relationships they have with us. They're my brothers. They remember the condition of our lives. And they are, the dead are, the most evangelistic souls in existence. Because they realize eternity is real. Eternity is long. And if this rich man could have any wish at all other than a drop of water for his own tongue, he would have somebody go back and talk to his brothers so that they don't come to this terrible place. The urgency of today. The Bible reminds us in 2 Peter 3 verse 9, God is not willing that any of us should perish. He doesn't want that for you. He doesn't want that for any of us. God wants everybody to be saved. He is patient with us, but he's not going to be patient forever. In Acts chapter 2, verse 40, on the day of Pentecost, as Peter was preaching about the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, he told those people to repent and be baptized, everyone, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. That's what he told them to do in Acts 2, 38. And then he kept on preaching. And in Acts 2, verse 40, he says, be saved urgently. He persuaded them, be saved from this crooked generation. There's an urgency to obedience. Don't put it off. Don't wait another day to obey God. God's will. This is a matter of where you're going to be eternally. And life is too short and too uncertain for you to take a chance, a risk with your soul. This rich man learned that salvation is not to be neglected. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? James 4, 13 through 15 warns us, don't boast about tomorrow. You don't know what the day will bring forth. You're making plans that you're going to go here and there and engage in business and make a profit. You don't know what your life will be like tomorrow. What you ought to say is, if God wills, we shall live and also do this or that. Don't boast about a day that's not been given to you, not been promised. There is urgency, brothers and sisters and friends, to obey, obeying God's word now to doing what you know is right and obeying God's will and obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. What did this lost soul learn in death? Number four, he learned about the sufficiency of God's word. You know, a lot of people, their attitude toward the Bible, a lot of people don't even have a paper copy anymore, or at least they don't know where it is. They keep it on their phones or they keep it on their iPads or their tablets, whatever. That's fine if you want to keep your Bible there, but don't leave your Bible unread. Don't leave it in the back seat of the car until next Sunday. Don't leave your, your app unopened because there is comfort and there is wisdom and there are warnings. There is a tremendous amount of good that can come to your life because this book was given to us by God. And notice, the rich man wants to send Lazarus back from the dead. Warn my brothers, you know, and his, his, his surmising, his, his guess is, well, if, if Lazarus goes back and, and he talks to them, they're going to be amazed that somebody rose from the dead. And, and Lazarus, we, we went to your funeral. We saw what happened to your, your body. We, we buried you, but now you're back. And, and that the rich man thinks his, his brothers are going to believe if they see something like that. I mean, that's amazing. How could anybody disbelieve that? Abraham says, and these are the words of Jesus now. They have Moses and the prophets. This was before the New Testament was written. They have Moses and the prophets. They have their Old Testament. Let them listen to what the Old Testament teaches. Let them obey that. But no, Father Abraham, if somebody goes back and rises from the dead, certainly they'll obey. And Abraham says, if they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they believe even though somebody rises from the dead. 
I am amazed at the psychology of the Bible. God knows what's going on in our hearts. God knows what's going to cause us to believe. And God knows that His Word is more powerful than a miracle. There are a lot of people today that say, I I just want to see a miracle. If I could just see something amazing, then I'd believe. God says, no, you wouldn't. If you won't believe my word, which has a tremendous, amazing amount of confirmation to know that this is the word of God. If you won't believe this word, I know you, God says. You won't believe even if you see a miracle. Think about all the people that saw the miracles of Jesus and still cried out, crucify him, crucify him. We don't want him. Think about all the people that saw the miracles of Jesus and walked away or laughed at him. Or some of them even said, he's not doing those miracles by God's power. He's doing those miracles by the power of Satan. Mark chapter 3. God says, I know what's going on in your heart. If you won't hear my word, if you won't listen to what this book teaches, you wouldn't believe even if you saw a miracle. That's the point. The sufficiency of God's Word. In the Bible, God has given us everything we need to know who God is, what He wants of us, and how we can have a relationship with Him. And He's done all of that in His Son, Jesus Christ. His Word, the Bible teaches us, is like a fire. It's like a hammer. It is something that changes our very core of our being. Jeremiah 23, verses 28 and 29. When God's Word goes forth, it always accomplishes its purpose. Isaiah 55, verse 11. His Word is that which produces faith in us. If you're lacking faith right now today, listen. The way that you gain faith is by believing and trusting the promises of God in His Word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. God's Word is powerful. It is life-changing. It will change everything about how we think and how we act, our motives and our attitudes. God's Word will do that. The gospel is God's power unto salvation, Romans 1, verse 16. God's Word saves souls. With meekness, James says, receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. James 1 verse 21, God's word makes people free. If you are abiding in the truth in me, Jesus says, you will know the truth and the truth shall make you free. John 8 verses 31 and 32, abide in my words. God intends for us to have a deep and intimate relationship with him and he shows us how to do that in his word. And so there's the rich man in torment. There's the rich man wishing that something would change in his brother's lives, wishing that they would change their hearts and change their attitudes and not come to this place because he knows where they're headed. He knows where they're going to be when they die. And the answer that's given, you've got the Bible. If you don't believe what it says, there's nothing else God can do to force you to believe. Do you believe, are you listening to the words of Scripture this morning? I'm not talking about just now, I hope you are, but are you listening to the words of Scripture in your life daily? Are you letting God's will and God's Word change the way you think about people, the way you think about what you're doing in life? Are you letting God's Word show you God's will for you? It's sufficient to do that. Let it do that. Finally, what did this rich man, what did this lost soul learn in death? The tragedy of a wasted life. I hope good things for all of you with your lives. I I pray for all of you. I pray that you will be blessed on every side. I pray that you'll have success in all kinds of wonderful ways. But I want to tell you something. If you live your life and you die outside of Jesus Christ or apart from Jesus Christ, you have wasted your life. Whatever else good we might say, and we'll say nice things about you at your funeral, but whatever else good we might say about you, if you die apart from God, you have wasted your life. There's no other way to put it. What shall it profit a man, Jesus asks, if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? What would a man give in exchange for his soul? Mark 8, 36 and 37. Your soul is the most precious, the most valuable thing you possess. That's why Jesus says, I've come to seek and save souls that are lost, Luke 19, verse 10. Because the tragedy, the greatest tragedy that could ever happen is for someone to waste their lives. 
doing things that are trivial and unimportant and empty and ultimately do not bring us closer to God. In Luke 12, verse 20, a similar passage to the one we're reading this morning in Luke 16, there's a rich man who has a bumper crop and all he can think about is he needs more closet space, he needs more barns to store his good stuff. And God says, you are a fool. This night your soul will be required. Then who's are all these things going to belong to? You know, a lot of people get wills written up and you probably ought to do that if you're trying to be wise about the people you're leaving behind when you leave this world. But you know, you don't really have any control. Whatever that document says, you're gone. Whose will these things be? You've accumulated them for yourselves. Don't use your life that way. The things that you've prepared. Haunting questions that the Bible asks. Pilate asked maybe the most haunting question of all. What shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? What should I do with him? He's been revealed to me by God. As I read the pages of the New Testament, I read about Jesus and how he came to this world and he suffered and he taught and he did miracles and he died on a cross. And the, the meaning of that is that he wants me to be able to be forgiven of my sin and to have a relationship with God. That's what that was for. What am I going to do with him? What are you going to do with him? The story of where you spend eternity and where I spend eternity is going to come down to that question. What have you chosen to do with Jesus? Love him, obey him, serve him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Don't be selfish and self-centered. Don't be like the rich man who found himself too late confronting some lessons that all of us ought to be learning right now today. Life is too short for us to waste it. Don't waste yours. The way somebody becomes a Christian, hear God's word, it's sufficient to save. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the only one who can save you. Confess that He is God's Son. Repent of your sin. Be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. The Bible teaches that when we are baptized, that we are putting on Christ. Galatians 3 verse 27. The Bible teaches that at the moment of our baptism, we are buried with Christ and we are raised with Christ. Romans 6 verses 3 and 4. If you'd like to make that decision this morning, if you'd like to respond to heaven's invitation, won't you come while together we stand and while we sing?